Well, good afternoon, everyone. If those awards tell us anything, it tells us what extraordinary people you have working in your industry. So congratulations to all those who have received awards and those who are receiving awards afterwards. First of all, just thank you for inviting me. I start, unfortunately, with two apologies. Um, firstly, I'm very conscious that I'm the person that stands between you and lunch, and that's never a comfortable position to be in. Um, and secondly, I'm not able to stay as long as I'd like to with you today. Um, you may be aware the government has yesterday introduced fast-track legislation on data retention. The House of Lords' debate is this afternoon, and I'm the second speaker in the debate, and so once I've spoken today, I have to leave um, and dash back to Westminster. So I am sorry, but I didn't want to miss the opportunity of being with you today and just to make a few comments. Um, but I'm disappointed not to spend longer with you and talk to more of you afterwards, and I'm also very disappointed that I'll miss the lunch. Um, I'm a new face to most of you, um, but I hope this will be the start of what will be a good and productive relationship between us. I've had an interest in the industry for some time, and as a shadow Labour Minister in the House of Lords for Home Office issues, I shadow Lord Taylor of Holbeach, who I know is known to many of you as the Government Minister who has responsibility for the private security industry. And recently, note of my interest, Yvette Cooper asked me to take on responsibility within our party on this issue, so I was glad to do so. So I'm new to you, but I have been around a while. Um, I did 13 years as a Member of Parliament. I was a Minister in the Department of Communities and Local Government, the Cabinet Office, and also spent three and a half years as a Minister in Northern Ireland. I was the Parliamentary Private Secretary to the Prime Minister for two years, and I've now been in the House of Lords um, for four years and dealing with home issues on our front bench for the last three. So I hope the experience I bring to this role working with you will be helpful to all of us. There's just three things I'd like to say today. I think firstly I'd like to say something about my initial perceptions about your industry. Then I'd like to say something about the challenges I think you face and then just finally say something about how I think we can work together and as time goes on hopefully we'll have the opportunity to discuss those in greater detail. But just around initial perceptions, the more I speak and talk to people involved in the private security industry, the bigger and broader it seems to get and I think the awards we've seen show far so the depth and breadth of your role you now play and your role in public safety is now just part and parcel of our way of life. The scale, the size, the breadth of the industry means you are a very significant employer and have a large number of small and medium sized enterprises as well as larger companies. So not only do you have an economic impact for the country as a whole, but also whether we're looking at the more traditional guarding roles in security and supervision or the more technological specialist security service, most members of the public now have some point of contact with you, your services, your products, even though they might not be aware of it. And just for an example, the partnerships with the police, they're not just now about back office functions, but it's also custody suites. So in today's world, that line between public and private in providing services is increasingly blurred, and you have a greater role in that. Private staff might be employed by public agencies, companies will have public sector contracts, there's domestic security, business and personal security, and of course new technology has brought new challenges, for example, in cybercrime. Last week I tabled amendments to a government bill on serious crime, seeking to beef up the provisions in that bill on cybercrime. This week we're proposing new amendments on identity theft, which bizarrely isn't in itself an offence, because these are relatively new issues coming forward. So the landscape that we're all operating in has changed not just from 50 years ago, but from 20 years ago and even 10. Increasingly, local authorities and the police are working with you, so, so often the public won't be clear whether your front-facing role is by, by the police or local authorities or private companies. And your work in cyber security, intelligence, IT forensics, for example, is developing in partnership with the government and others. And today, that is really central to the protection of national infrastructure and national security, as well as those more traditional roles that you're well known for. There's a traditional Chinese curse. I always think it's particularly apt to business and politics. 
And it says there are no problems in life, they're just challenges and there's opportunities. And as you make most of those new opportunities, you find new challenges present themselves to you. So if we just look at some of those challenges, it just seems to me, looking in, that it's never been more important for the industry to have not just a good reputation, but an excellent reputation. Over the past few weeks, my main area of work has been on the Serious Crime Bill. <clears throat> and that's a new government bill to tackle serious and organized crime and some of the most serious threats that's faced for a peaceful society. It might be drug trafficking, it might be people trafficking for slavery and prostitution, child pornography, paedophilia, all of these issues. And it's also money laundering of the ill-gotten gains of these activities. Where I think this is interesting to your industry, and I've raised this in debates, is that measures have been introduced so that anyone who knowingly profits from organized crime, even if their specific role isn't illegal, is committing an offense. Now, this is largely targeted at dodgy accountants, lawyers, and landlords, for example. But the professional associations who represent these groups, who have a vested interest and a clear interest in ensuring their members are honest and decent and act within the law, they haven't called for these measures, and they question whether or not they're needed, given the other measures that are already in place to protect them and their customers. So that's a debate we're working on. But yet here, in the private security industry, we have a profession that is begging the government to introduce legislation for regulation. We have an industry that's actively lobbying the government for regulation. We have an industry that has responded in massive numbers to the government's consultation on regulation, and yet we've seen nothing. Now, my understanding is the only consultation the government has issued that had a bigger response than yours was the one on gay marriage, and yours had the vir virtue of being virtually unanimous. So I don't understand the lack of will to legislate. I'm not going to criticise government unfairly. I've been in government. I know it's difficult to get parliamentary time to do all the things you want to do. And I also know the frustration as a minister wanting to get legislation in your area when you see other what you think are less important bills getting priority over what you think is crucial. So I never expected ministers to take regulation through on day one, even though my understanding is that most of the groundwork has already been done. But that timetable the government announced is now slipping and falling away. In the last two years, we've had two bills where the regulation of the private security industry could have been included. And not only did the government fail to do it, it actively stopped it. Antisocial behaviour bill introduced last year was what we call a Christmas tree bill. It means you just hang everything on it, throw everything into the bill. So we had antisocial behaviour, we had forced marriage, we had the police college, we had dangerous dogs, huge range of issues. An ideal bill as a vehicle for regulation for the industry. But though there was nothing in the bill, Baroness Ruth Hennig, who I know is known to you all, brought forward amendments with our full support to regulate the industry. And the government opposed it, despite her best efforts. And now, with the serious crime bill going through Parliament, the government's again missed the opportunity. So that makes your work, I think the excellent work that you're doing, maintaining and enhancing the re industry reputation more difficult. And there are two areas that feed into that. And one is gender equality, and one's the churn in the industry. When we see more public-facing roles of the industry, there can only be a benefit to getting better gender balance and not to lose out on the talents of so many of 50% of the population. And we can see here today that more women are becoming attracted to the industry. Because much of your work is gender neutral, and I know that you recognize those challenges and the opportunities here. And I think I'd welcome today the election of Pauline Nordstrom, and congratulate Pauline on not just someone whose reputation and knowledge make her an excellent choice, but as just the second woman to chair the BSIA, I think it's an important front-facing role that she will have for the industry. Congratulations, Pauline. So in record... <laughs> So in recognising, I've said, the scale and breadth of the industry, we can recognise there are more opportunities for women than many people outside the industry appreciate. And I also really applaud your efforts to bring greater professionalism to the industry and cut down on staff turnover. Skills for security is an ideal opportunity to show the industry as a career for the young and the not so young and the men and the women who want a longer term career and not just a short term job. 
So in both these areas, not only do you as associations, as business, businesses, want your members to step up to the challenge and play your part, you have a right to expect government to do the same. Now, last week, I got sold off a bit by the minister because he chided me for raiding the issue again. And he made a slightly obscure comment for having spoken to Lady Hennig on, about the issue on the bus. She leaves no stone unturned in raising the issue. And he then went on and said that the government is working to achieve measures that he thinks the House would support. So it's not just the lack of urgency, it's working to achieve, um, and we're aiming to get, but it's also the lack of certainty of seeing any action in this Parliament. The time it hasn't just slipped, it's fallen off the cliff, and we're coming to the end of the Parliament with no meaningful progress, despite your best efforts to get the best for your industry. So in terms of how we can work together for the future, I think you're doing absolutely the right thing in lobbying for regulation. You're showing that responsibility, a commitment to your industry, and you're enhancing your reputation, impressing that regulation. It's not an ideological issue. It's only used for purpose and when a case can be made for the benefit of regulation. And you're clear about that purpose, you're clear about the benefits, and I believe you've made your case. And we believe that in that case as well. We believe in that regulation of the industry and believe you deserve better. So I look forward to working with you to make that case heard at the highest levels. So thank you for inviting me along today. I really do hope you enjoy your lunch. I'll look enviously at the food being served as I leave, um, but enjoy your lunch and I look forward to meeting you again. Thank you.